Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for worship today on Sunday, September the 20th. And worship is coming to you from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Victoria. You can look forward in this service to a, a sermon from Matthew Kitchener on the book of Ruth, the second chapter, a kid's story from Ristelson, and also a report on bikes for Bibles from the Gastons. And now let's open with a word of prayer. God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, work among us and gather us together with you. Take our many diverse selves, our lives, our loves, our ideas, our questions, our speech, our silence, and unite us as your people. Give us the gifts of perception and understanding to help us dream your dreams and see your visions as well as witness your presence in the details of our everyday lives. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. and I'm here in beautiful Cranbrook cheering in these brave warriors Viking for four days love it love the age groups love the cause and just glad to be here to cheer them on oh, the ride was amazing a lot of fun I love the people would you encourage others around your age to come try it 
Definitely. And yeah. so I'm just having a great time. So I uh, give it a try. And it's been a wonderful ride and I just thank everybody for putting this all together. We've had a, a great ride up and down the hills and enjoying the beautiful scenery. It's been a fantastic day and we're, we're blessed to have such a wonderful weather. It's about being support for the team now and support for the cause of course. So far the ride has been absolutely glorious. Great people, great event. And Justin, well, what can we say? Justin who? Like, who is this guy anyway? This guy who's oh, behind Justin. the camera. Justin. Where's the lattes, man? Where's the lattes? Oh. It's been a great ride. Really awesome. Right. Yeah, beautiful. That was an awesome ride. Four days, 460 some kilometers. Thank you, Bike for Bibles. Woo! to the university this week at lunchtime. I often used to meet students up here at lunch. There's the McPherson Library. And there was hardly any people. Normally at lunchtime this place is full of students outside socializing and eating their lunches. And oh, who's that? Ristleson, what are you doing at the university? Well, I'm just taking my lunch break. You are? Yeah. You're studying. Oh, yeah. good for you. And then, in the afternoon, I have to go home and study. Oh, you're a very busy student. Now, where do you think all the students are? Well, some are inside, and some other students are home studying oh. because of COVID. Right, that's right. So people are trying to stay away from each other and still learn things. Oh, you know, so we kind of miss having students around the church, don't we? Um, yeah. Yeah, but you know, I was really lucky this week. I got to meet with three students and they came to sing on a worship team with me. Oh? Yep, and I know there's more here and we're going to have student dinner this Tuesday. So, Maybe I should come too. Yeah, you could meet the students because you're studying now. Yeah. I'm wondering if you'd like to pray today for our students who have had to learn to study in different ways and for the people that will serve them dinner on Tuesday. Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Okay. There you go. Thank you, Ristelson. And I hope, no every, I hope everybody that's watching takes a minute right now and prays for the students and for the student dinner ministry. Goodbye, Ristel. Have a good study. Bye. We are so thankful to have some students back this fall, particularly the ones that are on the worship team today. And we're going to introduce you to them one at a time. First, starting with Margaret, who plays Jambe for us. Hi, I'm Margaret, and I'm entering my last year of my Bachelor of Science and Linguistics at UVic. Over the summer, I stayed here in Victoria living with my grandmother and most of the time was working on my neuroscience course and also did some cross-stitching. And we have Brogan, who is joining us on vocals today. Hi, I'm Brogan and I'm in my third year in computer science at UVic. And in, I went back home in summer in Coquitlam to stay with my parents and I took a couple, couple of classes. And Connie, who's playing guitar and singing today. Hi everyone, I'm Connie. I'm going into my third year of my Bachelor of Music degree at UVic, studying flute and musical arts. Over the summer I worked from home in Port Coquitlam and I picked up crocheting and music recording. 
And for any students that are back in town, um, we are having student dinners again. They'll be in a modified form starting on September the 22nd. It's a Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock. You'll be able to line up outside in a, a socially distanced way, and you'll be picking up um, food that's already prepared in a, a container for you. And if you want to sit around on the lawn and talk with each other in a socially distanced way, you're most welcome to do that. So join us on September 22nd for the student dinner.
Hello, church. Let's begin today by reading scripture. Today's reading is from Ruth chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the fields, pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you noticed me? a foreigner. Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. This is the word of the Lord. So today we get to meet our second character in the book of Ruth. We get to meet Boaz. Now, that's not a name we hear very often, not super well known. Consider some of these other names, Liam, Noah, William, James, Oliver, Benjamin, Elijah, Lucas, Mason, Logan. These are the top 10 boys names of 2020 so far. You have to jump down to number 2,528 and you'll find the boy's name Boaz. I'm arguing that this should be much, much higher. I believe that what Boaz did is very worthy of our reflection and understanding today. Did you hear what happened? The story begins with a massive cultural distance between Boaz and Ruth. I mean, think about it. Ruth is the ultimate outsider. She's a foreigner. She's poor, a woman in a man's world, and she is a childless widow. Her only connection to this land is her old mother-in-law, another childless widow. And so Ruth is about as far outside the center of power as you can be. Boaz, on the other hand, is the ultimate cultural insider. He's male, 
He's a wealthy landowner, people working for him. And in this righteous culture, he seems to be a very righteous man. The chapter begins and ends with people declaring him blessed. You could think of this field, this place in the chapter as his field of influence. This is certainly the place where Boaz is at the center of power. These two very different people end up crossing paths. The Hebrew is actually really interesting. It says of Ruth that she by chance chanced upon the field of Boaz. By chance, she chanced upon the field of Noah, Boaz. I think there's a wink, wink, nod, nod here. Yeah, it's sure, it was chance. Well, then the foreman, he sees her, the head of the hired crew, then Boaz sees her. And as they begin to realize who she is and why she's there, two sets of commandments must have come to their minds. The first is from Deuteronomy 23. Moses is re-giving the law here as he's about to die, and he's leaving a detailed set of instructions. Now, listen to his words about the people from Moab. You heard a short snippet of this last week, but this is the fuller version. He says, no Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation, for they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt, and they hired Balaam to pronounce a curse on you. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loves you. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them for as long as you live. There it is, black and white. No entry into the assembly of the people of God for 10 plus generations. I mean, it says in another spot, even people from Egypt can come in after three generations, and they were the ones who enslaved Israel. No treaty of friendship, though, for Moab. The posture towards Moab is one of exclusion, push to the outside. So according to this directive from Moses, uh, things for Ruth do not look good. But there's a diverging directive in just the next chapter, at least how it's broken up in our Bibles. In the very next chapter, Moses teaches this. When you're harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. So here we have Ruth, a foreigner, a widow, and she's left her father when she comes to Israel. All three apply to her. So we have two texts, one excluding Ruth and one pulling her close. Which is going to hold the most weight? Well, for the foreman, it seems that it was her Moabite-ism. Uh, the NIV kind of cleans up the language when the foreman is talking with Boaz, but in Hebrew, it's, it's awkward, and it almost feels like the author wants you to get the feeling that he's stammering out an excuse. And it's not at all clear that he's even let Ruth into the field with the workers. It's possible she's kind of standing there awkwardly on the side. And so maybe what's going on is that Boaz is like, what, what gives? And the foreman is just stammering, uh, 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 Moabite, M Moab. You see, twice he mentions the thing that excludes her, her Moabite background. Literally, he says, she's from the fields of Moab. She is other, outside. Well, as other workers looked at her, for the other field workers, she could have been seen as someone to take advantage of. Boaz uses language that indicates that other harvesters might be hostile, violent, or even sexually take advantage of this vulnerable woman. And we can understand 
sadly, in our, in our culture, for we hear stories over and over again of vulnerable women abused by men in power. But Boaz is the most influential man here. And he goes a totally different direction from his foreman or those that might abuse her. Boaz is radically different in the best way. He's radically different from his own people. I don't know if you heard this, but go back and look later. He never mentions the word Moab. His description of her actually is based on her loyalty to Naomi, not her homeland, her faithfulness. And this is a word that describes God and what God asks of God's people. And in the rest of his interaction with her, he is drawing her from the outside toward the center. His first word to her is a word of connection. He says, my daughter. This is not a patronizing term here. This is actually an address that invites her from the fringes and shows his intention to take at least some responsibility for her well-being. My daughter. But he takes it another step. He solidifies it by giving her a, an official connection. He gives Ruth a status among the women who work for him. He gives her a job. You fit here. You have a role here, he's saying. Different from his own people. Radically different as well from the way the Moabites treated Israel. You see, there was a reason Moses was so harsh toward Moab earlier as Israel was escaping Egypt. They're exhausted in the desert. They're hungry. They're thirsty. They're wandering through this land. And they come upon the land of Moab. And they think, surely Moab will let us through. I mean, they're descendants of, of Lot, this nephew of Abraham. Surely, with that connection, they'll let us through. They promise, we won't take any of your, of, of your food. We'll just want to come through. But instead of the Moabites trying to bless them, or feed them, bring them water or bread, they didn't. They hired a prophet to curse them. And what we see of Boaz is the exact opposite. When Ruth is tired, he gives her a place to rest, to sit. He offers her water that the men have drawn. I mean, this is a remarkable reversal in that culture. Women would draw water for men. Foreigners drew water for Israelites, not vice versa. And then during lunch, Boaz ensures that she has enough grain to eat and even more than enough. It's astounding. Instead of looking at her and punishing her for what her culture had done earlier, for the Moabites' lack of hospitality, he flips it on his head and he shows gracious hospitality to this person right at hand, something the Moabites should have done. He shows that. Now, in Hebrew narrative and poetry, often it's at the center of the story where we find the most important nugget, something crucial. And the center of this story here in chapter two is Boaz praying a blessing over Ruth. And again, this is the opposite of how Moab treated Israel. In the longest interaction between these two nations, Moab's king, in kind of a humorous way, is trying to get Balaam to curse Israel. And Balaam can't from one perspective. So the king of Moab says, well, try this other perspective. Maybe you'll be able to curse from there. Well, try this place. Maybe you'll be able to curse from there. I'll pay you more. But Balaam cannot. Boaz prays a prayer of blessing. And not only prays this blessing over Ruth, but he embodies the blessing. He ensures that the workers make sure she gets enough grain. Even if they have to pull some out just for her, he makes sure she is abundantly provided for. Well, what is it that drives Boaz? What is it that brings on this, this gracious hospitality? And again, it's at the pivot point of this story that we find what is driving Boaz, and it is his vision of God. 
What's God like? What we see in verse 12, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel. And here it is, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Using this beautiful image of a mother bird sheltering her chicks, Boaz knows God to be the one who is a shelter to all who come to him for refuge, Israelite or foreigner. And he's right. This is what God is like. We hear it again in the words of Moses earlier in his long speech to Israel. Uh, in Deuteronomy, we find these words. The Lord your God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. He loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. It's Deuteronomy 10. Boaz knows the heart of God. What a model for us as we interact with immigrants, refugees, those we might view as other or excluded. Boaz, who sees God as one who shelters, makes that God visible. He reflects God's love for the foreigner and the widow. Boaz embodies God's sheltering and providing care. But how do we know? We have two different men who view Ruth in two different ways. How do we know that Boaz, as opposed to his foreman, chose the right way to treat this woman from Moab? Well, we, looking at Boaz from thousands of years later, have the privilege of seeing Boaz through the lens of Jesus, God incarnate. And Boaz ends up looking an awful lot like Jesus, who invited those from the fringes come inside, like the woman with a very sketchy past washing his feet with her hair, another woman caught with a married man, or the Samaritan who had had multiple husbands. These, along with many men on the fringes of society, are invited to come be my disciples. We started by asking last week, what is God's invitation to us through the lives of these characters? We began with Naomi and now Boaz. I wonder, what if Christians were known as a Boaz community? Those who notice and bless the people God brings across our path seemingly by chance. Wink, wink, nod, nod to embody God's blessing and care in this place, in, in your place, the paths you find yourself. You see, this is a time for Ruth and Naomi where God seemed hidden in their distress, in their grief. But Boaz shows them God is not absent. Boaz shows God's sovereign care by treating Ruth so well on that day when God brought Ruth across his path. And because Boaz is aware of God and reflects God's heart, Boaz ends up being part of a larger story than he could ever have imagined, being a part of hope and renewal, not only for Ruth and Naomi, but for Israel and beyond. Now, we, when we consider our own place in this story, most of us listening today are probably more like Boaz in our influence than Ruth. Many of us are closer to the center of society. And so let's ask ourselves, who has, quote unquote, by chance, come into our sphere? And might God have brought them for us to embody his blessing? I realize that in the last few months, many of you have bubbled with others, family members or close friends. Well, they're the nearest ones. How could you bless them? What is God's invitation for you in those relationships? But don't stop there. How could you creatively care for those not in your bubble? What might it look like for you to use your God-given influence to draw others closer to the center? And I do realize that among those listening, there will be those who feel like Ruth's, those far from the center. And maybe there are 
places in each of our lives where we feel like we're on the fringe, estranged. So to the Ruths, the ones who find yourselves on the edges, the way Boaz treated Ruth, that embodies the heart that Jesus would later fully live out, the giving of rest, of provision, of protection. And so maybe your step today as a Ruth is to honestly and bravely come before this Lord and say, I don't have the resources I need. I need your favor today. I can't do this on my own. So to the Ruth's listening and to the Boaz's listening, wait, may we have the courage and wisdom and creativity to embody the beautiful, sheltering, sustaining heart of God. Amen. May we bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, maker of all things, sovereign Lord, our Lord, we come to you in the awareness of our own weaknesses and our need. We are so thankful that you provide for us your love, your care, and your abundant mercies every day. We come in deep gratitude for who you are and that you in your love and wisdom have chosen to adopt us as your children to be loved and nurtured by you. Lord, we have been the recipients of your love and grace long before we ever knew you or were aware of your presence in our lives. Today we learned about the kind of love you offer to each one of us through the story of Boaz and his care for Ruth and Naomi. Here was a person who had abundant resources and lived a privileged life. Yet he, in his modeling of your love, graciously sowed mercy and love in his gracious and gracious and generous heart to those who came by in their need and in their fragile existence. Lord, help us to model your love to others. Help us to be gracious to those you bring into our lives, unexpectedly, unannounced, in a need in many and different ways. Help us not to sidestep an opportunity to show your gracious spirit to them. Lord, it's so easy to ignore, to step aside, or to bypass those we see in our neighborhood or our community that need your gracious hand of mercy. May we have your eyes as we look out into our community and to see the individuals that you may need, that may need an encouraging word today. Maybe those that could receive an act of generosity to get them through this difficult time during COVID. May we show gracious hospitality in whatever ways we can during this time. Lord, you are present with us here today. Thank you for these characters in the Bible that we can learn from and model our lives after. May we indeed build a Boaz community here at Emmanuel, a faith community trusting in your loving nature for our own needs and being strengthened by you to graciously pass on that love to those around us. There is such great need for companionship and community right now. Many are feeling isolated and alone. Help us to reach out in any way we have can be enabled to, to do and to help those around us. And now, Lord, as we conclude our worship, we will be listening to a song by Steve Bell. May we go from this place strengthened by the knowledge and experience of your love into your world with mercy and compassion and care. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless the poor, bless them with the treasures that the rest take for granted. Bless them with true prosperity, to have all that they need, enough and then some more to share. And wisdom to enjoy the priceless blessings flowing everywhere for free. And God bless the rich, bless them with the treasure that their money cannot buy. Bless them with generosity to realize we can own. Save the things we give away The only wealth worth having Is the joy of doing right and good for free
bless the wounded, the migrant and the refugee who seek just to survive. Bless them with hospitality to keep their hope alive. Just one more day through strangers who, in kindness, open hands and doors and borders until all are safe and free. God bless us all to never waste a moment or a breath or day or night. Bless us with gratitude to savor every taste, the gift of every present moment, and to dance with all our strength within your rhythm and your music.